today we are going to discuss some topics in preliminaries. So, again the topics include <coughs> some from analysis and some from linear algebra etcetera. So, specifically so let me mention what I am going to <coughs> do in this one hour uh, first discuss linear dependence and independence of functions. So, that is <coughs> very much used in the study of <coughs> uh, linear homogeneous equations later. So, linear dependence and independence of functions. And then we will also discuss the calculus lemma which was used which is going to be used in a qualitative <coughs> theory of differential equations. So, this is one specific calculus lemma there are many things in calculus, but this what I am going to uh, state about this lemma and then uh, an important a formula which is referred to as differentiation under integral sign so this is going to be used for example in the study of boundary valley problems using green functions <coughs> under an integral sign And then we will also use, uh, we will also <coughs> learn something about Taylor's formula, which will be used in the linearization theory of nonlinear equations. Okay. And finally, uh, we will also discuss some fixed point theorem and some related uh, issues. So, this is referred to as Banach fixed point theorem. So, we are going to learn about that. Okay. So, let me start with linear dependence <coughs> and independence of solutions for that so <coughs> so let i be a non empty interval in r okay so if this can be finite infinite doesn't matter and x is equal to. So, this is collection of all functions real valued functions defined on the interval. As of now, I am not putting any structure on this uh, solutions continuity or differentiability anything. So, they are just functions okay. and it is easy to check that uh, x. So, check x is a real vector space. So, if we are given two functions in this set x u 1 u 2, then I can define uh, their addition and multiplication by a real number and 
if u belongs to x minus also minus u also belongs to x and minus u is the uh, additive inverse of u and the identically zero function is the zero in this vector space. So, this is not difficult to check that x is a real vector space. <coughs> so, we are going to discuss uh, what is meant by linear dependence or independence of two elements in this uh, vector space x. Okay. So, let u 1, u 2 belong to x. Okay. So, the <coughs> this is general definition in any vector space. So, u 1, u 2 are said to be linearly independent if a 1 u 1 plus a 2 u 2 equal to 0 implies a 1 equal to a 2 equal to 0. The only thing we have to remember here is what is meant by this. So, this is 0 <coughs> in x. Okay. So, a 1 u 1 plus a 2 u 2 is again a function from the interval i <coughs> into real numbers. So, left hand side is a function and this is the 0 function. So, this means, so this implies a 1 u 1 t plus a 2 u 2 t equal to 0. Now, these are real numbers for all t in the interval i. Okay. So, whenever this happens, if that implies a 1 equal to a 2 equal to 0, then u 1 and u 2 are said to be linearly independent. Okay. So, otherwise u 1, u 2 are linearly dependent. Okay. So, now, we are going to <coughs> get some sufficient conditions on u 1 and u 2 for them to be linearly independent. Okay. So, that is the next <coughs> uh, next thing. So, <coughs> so, suppose a 1 u 1 t a 2 u 2 t is 0 for all t in i. So, u 1 and u 2 I am picking two functions and suppose their linear combination is 0. Okay. So, when can I conclude a 1 equal to 0, a 2 equal to 0? That is my question. Okay. So, for this purpose pick t 1, t 2 in i and t 1 different from t 2. So, pick any two distinct points and from this now if you substitute t equal to t 1 and t equal to t 2 because that is valid for all t in i. So, therefore, I have a 1 u 1 t t 1 plus a 2 u 2 t 2 t 1 equal to 0 and a 1 u 1 t 2 plus a 2 u 2 t 2 equal to 0. And now, look at these two linear equations, they are homogeneous because right hand side is 0 and consider that matrix u 1 t 1, u 2 t 1, u 1 t 2, u 2. So, if okay, so here a sufficient condition, if the matrix u 1 
t1 u2 t1 u1 t2 u2 t2. So, this is the coefficient matrix is non singular then it follows that because these are <coughs> two homogeneous equations and the determinant is non zero that matrix is non singular it follows that it has triv only trivial solution a 2 a 1 equal to a 2 equal to g. So, with this <coughs> condition, so if we are able to pick two distinct points in the interval i such that if this matrix is non singular then we are getting a 1 equal to a 2 equal to 0. So, that implies u 1 u 2 are linearly independent. So, let me shorten it. Okay. Okay. So, that is only a sufficient condition. It uh, does not appear to be necessary, but in this class x, is x is a huge class of functions. So, it is uh, difficult to <coughs> find an example, you can try that. So, converse may not be true. So, I just make a remark. So, you may check the may converse may or may not be true. So, I am not sure about that because that class is too big to <coughs> uh, may not be true. So, what I am trying to say is suppose you pick any two distinct points in the interval i and suppose for all the choices if this matrix is singular and yet the functions u 1 and u 2 are linearly independent. So, that you can. So, this question I put a question mark, okay. but when you take special functions. Okay, so, we are going to now uh, take a subset of x then we can say much more okay. that is the next thing we will go. <coughs> So, consider C 1 i C 1 i. So, this is a subset of x. So, I am. <coughs> so, these are ones continuously differentiable functions. Okay. So, this class is much smaller than x. Okay. And now, again let us study when two functions are <coughs> linearly dependent or independent. The previous discussion we just took two functions, you can also consider any finite number of functions and discuss their uh, linear dependence or independence and that the more algebra will be more complicated, but the, the same idea. So, instead of two distinct points you have to consider n distinct points and do that. Okay. So, again let me just restrict the discussion to two functions. So, let u 1 u 2 belongs to c 1 i and a 1 u 1 plus a 2 u 2 equal to 0. So, I would like to see under this condition when an imposing some conditions on u 1 u 2 if necessary when does it follow that a 1 equal to a 2 equal to 0 that means u 1 and u 2 are linearly independent. In this situation when they are both differentiable, so we get the second equation automatically. So, just differentiate this. So, my differential notation is a dot 
a 1 a 2 are just constants. So, when I differentiate the first equation I get that. So, dot is remember d by d t. Okay. Now, you fix one t naught pick any t naught in i then we have this a 1 u 1 t 0 plus a 2 u 2 t 0 equal to 0 and a 1 u 1 dot t 0 plus a 2 u 2 dot t 0. So, unlike in the previous situation now just one point will do and we are getting again two equations and from this we would like to conclude a 1 equal to a 2 equal to 0 and for that this coefficient matrix should be non zero. So, this matrix so if again this u 1 t 0 u 2 t 0 u 1 dot t 0 u 2 dot t 0 is non singular it follows that a 1 equal to a 2 equal to 0. Okay. And this matrix is called Ronsky matrix of u 1 u 2 at the point t 0 okay. and its determinant let me write here determinant is called Ronsky. So, we will introduce some notation Ronskyian of u 1 and u 2 at t equal to 0. So, let me just again write that thing. So, so put w u 1 u 2 at t 0 equal to determinant of this matrix u 1 t 0 u 2 t 0 u 1 dot t 0 and u 2 dot t 0. Okay. So, what we <coughs> saw in the <coughs> previous slide is that so if w u 1 u 2 t 0 is not 0 then u 1 u 2 are linearly independent. So, when you put more structure into the functions for example, here we have taken differentiable functions. So, we see <coughs> a simple condition and that to just at one point. So, even if the Ronskyian is non 0 at one single point those two functions u 1 and u 2 are going to be linearly independent. However, converse may be false. May be false, meaning so there exist functions u one u two such that w of u one u two at t is 0 0 for all t in the interval whichever interval we are considering, but u 1 u 2 are linearly independent. Okay. So, this 
on striking example. So, let me just mention that. So, example So, you work out the details. So, I is some interval containing both positive and negative real numbers say for example, minus 1 and 1 okay. and u 1 t is t cube and u 2 t is mod t cube. Okay. So, this is for t belongs to i. Okay. So, you readily see that u 1 is differentiable. So, you might have some trouble seeing that u 2 is also differentiable. So, let me just, <coughs> just mention here that. So, u 1 dot t that you easily do it. So, this is just 3 t square. So, u 2 dot t simple exercise. So, this is 3 t square if t is positive just you break this into several regions. So, you will see that if t equal to 0 and minus 3 t square if t is negative. Okay. So, it <coughs> is something 3 t square, but the sign changes that is important and using this definition and this computation, you see that Ronskian of u 1, u 2, t is 0 for all t in i. Okay. However, we show that <coughs> we show that u 1, u 2 are linearly independent. Okay. So, for that, so let a 1 u 1 t plus a 2 u 2 t is equal to 0 for all t in i. So, in particular you t equal to plus 1, you get a 1 plus a 2 equal to 0 and if you pick t equal to minus 1, you get minus a 1 plus a 2 equal to 0 and this will imply a 1 equal to a 2 equal to 0. Okay. So, such examples do not occur for some special solutions again some special functions. So, these are <coughs> so this remark. So, you are going to see this in the study of linear second order equations. So, consider this second order equation. So, u double dot plus p t u dot plus q t u equal to 0. So, linear homogeneous equation of second order. So, in some interval let me again just write any interval. So, if u 1 u 2 are solutions of this equation. then the Ronskian u 1 u 2 at infinity okay. uh, the Ronskian okay. that is a function is either identically 0 or never 0. So, very so 
if it is 0 at one point then it has to be 0 everywhere and if it is not 0 at one point then it has to remain non zero and this happens only for this u n u 1 u 2 are solutions of this homogeneous so that special functions and further u 1 u 2 are linearly independent if and only if see the earlier we proved if that is Ranskin is not 0 even at one point then u, uh, u 1 and u 2 are linearly independent. Now, here it is if and only if. Okay. So, we saw through this example this converse may not be true, but when u 1 and u 2 are solutions of this homogeneous second order equation then converse is also true if and only if the Ranskin is not 0. So, that is an important thing you are going to learn in the study of the second order uh, linear equations. Okay. So, now we move on to the calculus lemma. So, that is the next. Uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> so, let me state it. So, this, this is what I have in mind. So, this we are going to need in the study of qualitative uh, analysis of nonlinear systems so, yeah. so let chi be a real valued function defined on the interval ab and again this may be finite infinite it doesn't matter this interval finite or infinite or infinite satisfy. So, these are the assumptions on the <coughs> function chi either one of these two chi is bounded above in that interval and chi is non decreasing. Or chi is bounded below and chi is non increasing. Then limit chi t as t tends to b. So, b could be infinity. Okay, so, it does not matter exists. This limit exists means it is a finite number, finite real number. Okay. So, quick proof. So, assume 1. Okay. So, 2 is similar and in fact, if chi satisfies 2, then minus chi satisfies 1. Okay. So, if limit chi t exists then limit minus chi t also exists. So, so it is sufficient to <coughs> prove the lemma in one case. Okay. Since chi is bounded above, so put alpha is equal to supremum chi t t belongs to a b. 
and since we are assuming chi is bounded above, so this is finite. Okay. So, for any epsilon positive, so now we are going to show that the limit exists for any epsilon. So, if you consider alpha minus epsilon, epsilon alpha minus epsilon is not supremum of chi. So, therefore, there is exit at least one point in the interval where that alpha minus epsilon will be strictly less than chi of t 0. So, for any epsilon there exists t 0 in the interval a b such that alpha minus epsilon this is no more supremum. So, this should be less than chi t 0. Okay. And the <coughs> now, we use the second hypothesis. So, if t belongs to a b and t bigger than or equal to t 0, then since chi is <coughs> non decreasing. So, chi of t naught is less than or equal to chi t. So, if you put together the <coughs> previous inequality, so therefore, we have alpha minus epsilon less than chi t 0 and that is less than or equal to chi t and alpha is the supremum of all chi t, chi t belongs to a b. So, this is automatically less than or equal to alpha. So, for all t bigger than or equal to t. Okay. So, if you rewrite this thing, so just remove this chi t 0. So, this implies alpha minus chi t which is always bigger than or equal to 0 is less than epsilon for all t bigger than or equal to t. And this <coughs> is same as saying that. So, therefore, limit chi t as t tends to be exists and equals to alpha. Okay. So, that is very simple thing, but very useful one. So, this we will see in <coughs> many situations. And next, <coughs> we are going to discuss about this differentiation under integral sign. So, for this recall again from fundamental theorem of calculus. So, if f from a b to r is continuous is continuous and if we define f of t the indefinite integral a to t f s d s, then f is differentiable and f prime t is equal to f t. So, what I am going to state is a generalization of this. Okay. So, where uh, so this this you remember, okay. This you remember. So, this is a generalization of this. Okay, now <coughs> so again let alpha beta from uh, some interval a b. R be differentiable functions and 
functions and f is a function of two variables. So, T s uh, so, T belonging to a b okay, and s belonging to this interval alpha t beta t. Okay. In this notation usually you assume that alpha t is less than beta t. So, if beta t happens to be less than alpha t then you interchange it or beta t alpha t. Okay. So, there is no restriction on the <coughs> values of alpha and beta. So, alpha t at some t alpha t can be less than beta t at some other t beta t can be less than alpha t that does not matter. Okay. Be a continuous function function of both the variables and I am just taking partial derivative of f with respect to the first variable is also continuous. So, since we are essentially using Riemann integration, so these hypotheses uh, <coughs> are needed is also continuous. So, these are the <coughs> hypothesis on the this functions alpha, beta and small f. So, define now I am going to define a function of t alone f of t just like in the previous case, but now with all these things. So, integration is also the integral limits are now variables alpha t beta t and I am going to integrate with respect to s. Okay. So, remember that t is also t is just fixed. Okay. So, once you fix this t, so this you define for t in a b. Okay. So, then f is differentiable and so this is the formula it is not really difficult to prove it just like you do in the previous case you write f of t plus h minus f t by h and then you manipulate the integral limits you will get it. So, it is not at all hard. So, this is alpha t beta t d f by d t. So, now I am assuming that is continuous. So, this integral makes sense okay. and now since the limits are themselves variables. So, we get some additional terms and these are like this t beta t d b by d t and since this in the upper limit it comes with a plus sign and alpha t is in the lower limit that comes with a negative sign. d alpha by d t. Okay. So, just and this is very useful when you study boundary value problem. Okay. And the next topic of discussion is Taylor's formula.
So, let me again start with one variable. that is very familiar with you to you, all of you. So, let f from some interval a b to r be a c 2 function. So, I am assuming now f is twice <coughs> differentiable and that second derivative is also a continuous function okay. and you fix some x 0 in a. So, using mean value theorem and other things, okay. so it is not difficult to see that f of x 0 plus y is equal to f of x 0 plus f prime x 0 y plus f double prime let me just write j y square. So, this j is a point between x 0 and So, because we are assuming it is a C 2 function, so when y is small, so this quantity is bounded and usually we write that as okay, f of x 0 plus f prime x 0 y plus o of y square for y small. And this is very much used in linear linearization of nonlinear equations. And now, <coughs> once we have this for one variable case, we will see how to extend it for multivariable case. So, again, let me <coughs> start with one real valued function multivariable case. In fact, we reduce it to the one variable case. So, let d belonging to R n be an open set and f that same as that f now it is defined on this d to R be a C 2 function. So, in this case C 2 function means, so the all the first order partial derivatives and second order partial derivatives with all the variables n there will be n variables they all exist and they are continuous. Okay. So, again let x 0 belong to x and not x d and you choose a small ball. So, since we are assuming d is open and choose r positive such that b x 0 r is also contained in d. So, d will be something like that x 0 is here and I am just taking a mark of radius r that is fine. So, now we are just picking y there and trying to uh, so pick any y pick y in b x 0 ok. So, define so this is now f is from d to r. So, now I am going to define a one variable function. So, this is f of x 0 plus t y. Okay. So, t is between 0 and 1. 
Okay. So, now if you apply the one variable case, so with y equal to 1 and uh, x 0 equal to 0. So, therefore, we have f of 1 is equal to f of 0 plus f prime 0 into 1. So, that is fine and now f double prime j and j is between 0 and 1. f double prime. Okay. So, just try to I mean ignore this second order derivative we are not interested again that is bounded. So, we are going to. So, we are just interested seeing the the linear terms. Okay. So, let us calculate what f 0 is and f prime 0. So, f 0 if you look at the definition of the capital F function. So, f 0 I put t equal to 0 there. So, this is just f of x 0 and what is f 1? f 1 is f of x 0 plus y. Okay. And uh, uh, by chain rule, f prime t, let me just write f prime t. So, <coughs> so, this is a function of n variables. So, by chain rule, so this is just del f by del x j evaluated at uh, x 0 plus t y. into the differentiation of this argument with respect to t and there is only <coughs> uh, dependency is through this t y. Okay, so, we just get y j. Remember y is a vector. So, this is just y j. j equal to 1 to n. So, since we are in n variable case that happens. So, if we are interested in f prime 0, so therefore, f prime 0 is del f by del x j t equal to 0 means just x 0 y j. And this you can write in the notation of gradient. So, this is gradient of f at x 0 dot y. So, these are this is a vector and that is a vector. So, this is a scalar product. Okay. So, this is gradient. gradient. Okay. And so, therefore, if you put back x 0 plus y f of x 0 plus gradient of f at x 0 dot y plus let me just write that as y square. Okay. So, we are interested only in the linear terms and now you can just extend it to many variable case again let d be as before and now uh, let f from d to r n. So, you can also do it for r m. So, let me just for simplicity do just for r n and then f will have n components. Okay. So, f f 1 f 2 f n and each f j is now from d to R. And now, we can apply the previous discussion with this apply the previous formula in this for 
f j and if you do for all f j then so we have this then you put together we have this f of x 0 plus y now this is a vector so this is also a vector so you should get a vector here but y is only a vector so the that in if you want to get a vector out of that so you should multiply by a matrix and this is just y so this is n by n matrix and this called Jacobian of f. And if you <coughs> look at the previous formula and apply to each f j, so this d f x 0 is nothing but, so it is a matrix and each row is gradient f 1 at x 0 and you have gradient f n x 0. So, you write the gradient as a vector. So, the first vector coming from f 1, second vector from f 2 etcetera. So, this is a matrix. So, this is n by n matrix. Okay. So, finally, let me quickly discuss this fixed point theorem. Okay. For this we need the notion of a metric space. So, let x be a non empty set a function d from the Cartesian product to R is called a metric or distance function. If it satisfies the following three properties, so, if you take any two points in x, so their distance is always non negative and equal to 0 if and only if x equal to y. This property is referred to as positive definiteness and second one is symmetry. So, distance from x to y is same as distance from y to x symmetry and third one is called triangle inequality. So, d of x y is less than or equal to d x z plus d z y. So, these three properties should hold for all x y z in x. And uh, so, this again this notion comes from uh, the Euclidean distance. So, this is uh, for example, in R if you take x equal to R and the distance defined by the usual Euclidean distance. So, that is a metric and in R n again the standard uh, Euclidean distance. So, these are examples of metric spaces. Okay. Yes. <coughs> so, x d, so x is a non empty set and d is a metric on <coughs> x, is referred to as a metric space. Uh, so, <coughs> we have another uh, 
few minutes. So, let me just uh, a sequence. x n in x is said to be a Cauchy sequence if limit So, remember this when you put d. So, these are all real numbers now x m x m and this should go to 0 as m n goes to infinity. Okay. You can also write it in form of uh, epsilon. <coughs> okay. A sequence x n converges x n in x converges to some x in x if d x n x tends to 0 as n tends to infinity. So, a metric space is said to be a complete metric space if every Cauchy sequence in x converges to some point in x. So, it is easy to check if a sequence converges to some x that x is unique. So, a, a sequence cannot converge to uh, two elements in x. Okay. So, that limit is unique. So, now we are going to state this fixed point theorem Banach fixed point theorem. So, let x d be a complete metric space. So, completeness plays an important role. So, without completeness the conclusion of this theorem may be false. And T from mapping from x into x itself a be a contract. So, that is, so I am going to define what is contraction. So, if you take any two points x and y in x and now you take their images under T. So, T x T y are their images and you compute the distance between them and this should be less than or equal to alpha distance x y. So, for all for some 0 less than alpha less than 1 and all x y in x. The conclusion is then T has a unique fixed point.
that is there exist a star in x such that t x star is equal to x star and x star is unique in with this property. So, that is that is meant by that unique fifth point ok as a corollary So, let again the same setting. So, let t from x to x be such that. So, t need not be a contraction, but what we are assuming is t to the n is a contraction. So, t to the n means you compose t with itself n times. So, t square is t composite t etcetera is a contraction for some n bigger than equal to 1. Then T has same conclusion unique fifth point. Okay. Let, let me indicate how this corollary follows. So, proof of the corollary Okay. So, since T n is a contraction, we apply Banach's theorem. So, there exist unique x star such that T n x star is x star. Okay. So, because T n is a contraction, we are assuming T n is a contraction. And this implies, if I again compose with T, so T n of T x star is equal to T x star and by uniqueness. So, this is by uniqueness T x star is equal to x star because x star is unique. Now, we are showing that T x star is also a fixed point for T n and that is why we should have this T x star equal to T x x star and further further if t x is equal to x for some x. So, if t has another so that implies t n x is again x and that again by uniqueness implies x equal to Okay. And <coughs> especially with this hypothesis of the corollary is very useful that you are going to see in the existence of solutions of differential equations that is very much useful. Okay. So, with uh, this thing we will conclude uh, this lecture on some preliminaries. Thank you.